Well, we are continuing in our Genesis series, and how many have enjoyed the Genesis series? Okay, yeah, I'm glad that you have. I really enjoy uh, preaching through the books of the Bible, and the reason why is it helps me uh, connect dots between stories, and, and it helps see themes uh, throughout Scripture, and it helps me understand the Word of God a little bit better, um, and so I'm, I'm excited to share. Genesis chapter 13, the title this morning is, Where Are You Looking?, where are you looking? And I ask you this morning, are you looking up at God or are you looking out? Are, are you looking at God or are we, we turning to him, to his face, or are we just trying to, to live this thing called life on our own? Uh, before we uh, jump into Genesis 13, uh, I just want to challenge and encourage us to be relational. I know many of you attend Sunday school, um, but if, if you have not plugged in and made New Hope your church home, where you feel like, man, I'm still trying to find my people, you know, my tribe, like I come every week, can I just encourage you uh, to make an effort to be relational? And the main way that we do this is through Sunday school classes and Wednesday night Bible classes. Why do we do Sunday school still? Some people don't come from churches that had Sunday school. Why do we do that? Because during that time, your children are also being taught, if you have children or grandchildren, or if your spouse is a child like I am, okay, you, you're, they're being taught, and, uh, and it creates an opportunity where it's not another night out of the week. We don't need more things throughout the week. We've got sports practices. We've got different commitments. We've got different things that we're involved with. And so just staying that extra hour built into your Sunday routine can really make a difference. And if you faithfully show up to a class and you faithfully show up, you begin to share prayer requests. You begin to build those relationships. Faces don't just become familiar, but they become known. And that's what we want. New Hope has been a relational church since infancy of this church. For 32 years, it's been a relational church, and we want to maintain that relational feel. We don't want to be a big church. We want to be a whole bunch of small churches where people are connected, where when someone has a need and there's a, something going on in their life, that this isn't just a name, but that people are known and that you know people. So let me just encourage you, um, plug in, be relational. It's who we are. God uses people and that's one of his main ways that he shapes us, he grows us, he disciples us, is in relationship with people. We need you, and people, uh, and you need people. And so I uh, just, just want to challenge you in, in, in that. Uh, before we read um, from Genesis chapter 13, I'll just give a little bit of a recap of chapter 12. Now, Abraham is given this promise. And if you missed Sunday night a few weeks ago with Jared Atchison or last Sunday with Pastor Jeff in the morning, um, I'll just give you a, li a little snapshot of chapter 12. Um, God speaks to Abram and he gives him this promise. And in verse one of chapter 12, he instructs Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make you great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So what does Abram do? We see that he leaves his country, he leaves his people, but he does not leave his father's household. He decides to bring his nephew Lot along. Now Lot's father was Abram's brother. And he died. And so this made some sense to Abram, right? Like um, Lot has this longing to have a dad in his heart. He, he has this desire to have this missing figure in, in his life. He has this desire. And Abram, the scriptures say that Abram and Sarai, they were longing to have children, but they didn't have children. And so by bringing his nephew along, this was kind of a logical um, Decision. This was like, well, you know, maybe I'll bring Lot as an insurance policy, or maybe God is, you know, at this point in our life, maybe He wants to give, a, a, make a great nation through Lot. You know, He's He's kind of blood. He's 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 in my father's household. See, the problem is that Abram was walking by sight and not by faith. And, and we see this laced throughout scripture, and, and it's a, a theme within scripture where, where partial obedience is still disobedience. 
When God tells you to do something, we can't just do it just what we want to. We, we have to obey to completion. We have to bring that to a full effect of obedience, to, to the fullness of, of obeying Christ. And, and, and see, we get these promises, and Abram gets this promise from God, and he begins to see through his lens, and he fulfills it the way that he thinks it should be fulfilled. And that's exactly what the enemy wants, is that every time there's a promise of God that is spoken over you and given to you, the enemy wants you to fulfill that promise in your way. And you know what? Every time we fulfill promises of God in our way, it's a, it's a counterfeit of what God really wants to give us. That it's not the promise being fulfilled. And so we see Abram walking by sight, not by faith. And then later on in, in chapter 12 and verse 10, we see that because there's drought, because there's famine, that Abram decides to go down to Egypt. Again, a second time, Abram is walking by sight and not by faith. Why do you think that, that God may have led Abram to the Negev? Okay, the Negev is in the southern part of Israel. Why do you think he, he would take him to a more drier place, right? Do you think that it could be that God was trying to say, Abram, I'm bringing to you to a place where you cannot be made by yourself, but I want you to see that I am a faithful God. I, I want you to see that I will provide for you. Did you know that God might call you in life to places that seem a little bit too desert for your liking? a little bit uncomfortable, and God's saying, stay there, trust me, I will provide for you, but what do we do? This can't be God because this isn't good enough for me. This can't be God because this is a little too uncomfortable for me. Abram does not call upon the Lord in any of chapter 12, but then we see in 13 that he begins to learn from his mistakes. He begins to grow, he begins to mature, and things begin to change. So Genesis 13, after the longest introduction in the history of introductions, verse one, and you can follow along with me on the screens or in your Bible. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their processions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling began, arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. How would you like to have the last name Perizzite? I don't think I'd like, like Parasite, Perizzite, no, okay. Verse eight, so Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go left, I'll go right, and if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked around, and he saw the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Now this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north, to the south, the east, and the west. All of the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. So Abram went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents 
There he built an altar to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak through me this morning, that you'd communicate exactly what you want me to communicate, that uh, you'd take out anything in my notes, that you'd put things in as I've studied this, Lord. Allow your spirit to open up our hearts. Allow us to be sensitive to what you're speaking to us. I pray that you'd begin to speak things to people's hearts that are never said so that they would know that you are speaking to them this morning, that it's not uh, a pastor's words or anything like that, but that you would open up our hearts. So we wanna hear you. We want to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, we're gonna walk through this a little bit verse by verse, and then I'm gonna just share some thoughts. Is that cool with you guys? It's gonna be a little bit more like a a Bible study, um, but I'll do my best to make it interesting and not boring, okay? Okay. Man, you guys are quiet this morning. I love it. I must be that just intense. Starting in verse three, okay? From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place where Bethel and Ai, um, to, to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar, okay? Verses three and through four A. I find it interesting that after Abram decides to do things his own way, that he ends up back at the start. He begins, he he ends up after doing things his own way and not consulting of the Lord, that he ends up right back where he started at square one. Have you ever felt like you're spinning your tires? Like just getting nowhere in life? And, 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 you know, I, I think that there's times where we just feel like we're just burning, 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 running, 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 going, 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 and we're getting nowhere in life. In reality, it's God's grace that's keeping us still. It's God's grace that, that brings us back to the starting point. What do I mean by it's God's grace? It's, it's God giving us another opportunity to obey him. It's God giving us the opportunity to stop trying and start trusting him. It's God's preventing us from going somewhere that we shouldn't go, that we shouldn't be. God inviting us for him to do the work and for him to do the heavy lifting. Why? So that he might get the glory and it wouldn't be about us. I've tried many times in life doing things my own way. Anybody else been there? right? Like where you're just like, man, I just feel like I got to make this work. I've got to make my business grow. I've got to make this household float. I've got to provide for my family. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And God is saying, would you just rest with me for a moment? Would you just trust me that where I've led you and what I've called you to, that I'm going to provide for you? that you don't have to burn your candle at both ends, that I am the Lord of everything, I have the cattle on a thousand hills in the palms of my hand. I am the one who spoke the earth into into existence. And and would you just trust me in this moment? There's been times where I've tried to write sermons. And and I love preaching. I I love the, the, the process of getting deep into the word of God and seeing things that I haven't seen. And, and, and I love that, but there's been times, and I'll tell you this, where I've tried to do it in my own strength, where I've tried to do it in my own knowledge, in my own creativity, with my own take or whatever it is, and, and I get nowhere, and I end up back at square one. I end up back in the Negev. I end up back between Bethel and Ai, where it's just like, God, okay, I, I get it. You want me to be a part of this. What is it that you want to say? What is it that you want to communicate through me? Can I just suggest to you this morning, if you feel like you're stuck in life where you're just spinning your tires and you're getting nowhere, can I just suggest to you that that might be the grace of God being um, demonstrated in your life? That it's God saying, hey, I want to be a part of whatever you are going to do. Begin to thank God. If you feel like you're stuck, this isn't a time to shake your fist at God and say, why aren't you letting all my hard work pay off? This is a time to say, God, I thank you so much that that you are calling me to a relationship to walk with me. It could be God's grace preventing you from going down a path, from making that decision where he doesn't want you to be. Thank you, Jesus, that you bring us back to square one whenever we don't do things your way. 
Continuing in verse four, it says, there Abram called on the name of the Lord. He what? He called on the name of the Lord. Now, we could just blow uh, past this, but as I mentioned earlier, nowhere in all of chapter 12 does it say that Abram consulted the Lord, that he called on the name of the Lord, that he spent time with the Lord. He just starts making decisions based upon what he saw and not what he heard. He was looking out, not up. Abram, here in in chapter 13, verse four, he's growing, he's maturing, he's learning. This is a beautiful moment of repentance and confession where Abram's saying, man, I made a mess. I made a mess. You know what happens when we make a mess? You know what Satan says? He says, fix your mess. Pick it up yourself. You, you created this mess, you need, to, you, need to, you need to just pull up your bootstraps, you need to do this yourself. You know what God says when we make a mess? He says, are you done? <laughs> and then he says, can I help? And, and I'm so thankful that it doesn't matter how many times I've tried to do things and make decisions on my own, that there's always a God who is faithful in character and the person of who he is and that Yahweh is standing there saying, hey, I am with you. And, and at any point in time, I can call on the name of the Lord. Can I just encourage you this morning? If you've been doing things your own way, it's not too late to call on the name of the Lord. The mess that maybe you've created is not too great. God wants to be with you, helping you, sustaining you, encouraging you giving you wisdom in in all that you do, if you would just call on the name of the Lord. Be ready to respond because God wants to be with you, Emmanuel, this morning. And this morning, I'm gonna be ending with a time of altar. I'm gonna be ending with a time where if if at any point you feel like the Lord is revealing to you something that, that maybe you're, You've been looking with your sight and not looking to God first. Maybe there's something that you need to separate, uh, separate from and, and, and go different ways with. I would ask that you would respond this morning, that you would you'd be open to that. Let's continue and pick up in verse five. Now Lot, who is moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And the quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. Now first, would this conflict have ever happened had Abram just obeyed in the first place? Like, would would, uh, Abram's... Um, herders even have had the opportunity to be bickering with Lot's herders had Abram just obeyed in chapter 12 and left his father's household, right? So I think that begs a question, but what also we see in this is that this is just conflict over resources. This is conflict over things. This is conflict over resources. Many conflicts in life are over things, and, and it never ceases to amaze me. Black Friday comes, shooting at Walmart over a 75-inch you know, TV, right? Conflict over things. I've seen families divided over estates, over inheritances, over money, over things. We've seen world wars. We've got one happening right now where Russia is wanting the resources where he's wanting, and yeah, sure, there's probably other things and layers to that, but I've seen wars over oil and territory, and it has been for centuries. There, there is a lot of conflict over things. Are, are uh, resources and things a source of drama for you? And, 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 and I, I'm not saying and suggesting that um, we should just like, you know, sell our houses and build mini houses and just not own things. You know, like things can be a blessing. But one thing that I've just really noticed in my life, and this is just me being vulnerable, okay? I, 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 don't, um, I don't necessarily struggle uh, with, with different sins, you know, of, of, of like uh, 
pride or anger or, or lust or different things like that. I'm not saying that I don't struggle with those things, but the main way that Satan really gets to me is through the lust of the flesh. It's like in my hobbies. It's like getting my eyes off of God and onto whatever it is. And, and it's things that distract me from hearing the voice of the Lord. Do you relate this morning? Is, is God like revealing to you, man, you've got some drama in your life and maybe if you'd downsize, maybe if you would this, maybe if you would that. Are there things that you need to let go of? See, I am in a, a season right now where I really genuinely long for more of God's presence. But I understand and I'm coming to realize that the more things of the earth that consume my time and energy and effort, which often revolve and relate around resources, the, the more distracted I am and the less presence I can house of the Spirit of God. Jesus, I pray right now, God, just in this moment, that you would help me. That you would help me, God, to be a person that cares more about you, that cares more about people, cares more about people's souls and people's hearts than the things that this life can bring. And there's a lot of great things, God. There's a lot of fun things that you've provided us. But Jesus, may my heart not be divided May, may my heart not love things more than I love people or things and be distracted more than I love you, but may my heart always be after your heart, God. Help us, Holy Father. Help us, Jesus. Amen. Continuing quickly in verse eight. I'm trying to blow through this here. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. This is another expression of Abram's love for his nephew. Like, I, I, I've, I've learned this over life, that love is blind. You guys have heard that expression, right? Okay, love is blind not just in this sense, not just in the sense that love will, will make you blind to someone's shortcomings, but love is blind and can cloud, hear me parents and grandparents, it can cloud our decision making out of our love for someone else. That even when we know what is right and what God's asking us to do is right, our love for someone might prevent us from doing what is right. How, how, many, how many times has the Lord maybe spoke to you and said, hey, I need you to say this to your child or say this to your best friend and confront them, and, and the Lord is clearly asking you to do something, but your love for that person creates a fear that you don't wanna hurt this person. And so it's your love trying to protect them from a difficult truth when in reality, loving them wholly would be allowing God to speak through you into their lives. Am I being clear? Parents and grandparents, does your love for your children outweigh your love and devotion for the Lord? We can't just make loving decisions for our family, we have to make godly decisions for our family. Abraham was a righteous person Abram uh, was a peacemaker. He allows Lot to decide. But it was his love for Lot in the first place that clouded his decision, which led him to disobeying God of leaving his, his uh, father's household. You guys see that? Love is a beautiful thing, but our love needs to be set on Christ first. God help us. Verse 10 through 13, Lot looked around, saw the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zor as well watered, like the garden of the Lord, and like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord 
destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Lot looked around and he saw things that looked good. He doesn't look up to God. He doesn't consult God. He doesn't go to the altar there um, and, and, and call upon him the name of the Lord. He looks out. Scripture says he looks out and things appeared to be like the Garden of Eden. Things appeared to be like Egypt. Things looked good. How many know that in life things aren't always the way they appear? Anybody ever been bamboozled? Yeah, like a pyramid scheme or anything like that? Like, oh, this looks good, right? Make me some money. Man, I, 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 uh, I, I've just come to know that like, I can't trust my judgment. I can't trust my judgment. I, I, I wonder um, in dating, you know, for those who are in the dating or open to dating and things like that, I wonder if we went before the Lord before we even sent that first message or before we even pursued that, we just said, God, is, is this right? I believe that God could give you instant wisdom in that moment, say, you don't even need to send a message to this person. You don't even need to start the conversation because I can tell you this isn't gonna work. Levi Lusco in his book, Swipe Right, said this, the most important things of a person don't show up in a selfie, Is that not true? Things can look really good, but don't be deceived. We don't look out, we look up. What about in jobs? Pay packages and benefits don't always outweigh work environment. Don't always outweigh um, ethics of work. We need to look up and, and not look out. Lot used earthly wisdom and it led to his destruction. Pastor Kerry, preached a great message a few weeks ago on the Tower of Babel, and that's essentially what it is. You do things our way, and it leads to destruction. You do things God's ways, and they last forever. I, I, I have to wonder as I read this, it talks about the herdsman being the one in conflict, okay? Did the herdsmen, meaning those who were surrounding Lot, did they have influence over Lot's decision of where he chose to live? And, and I ask you this, what voices are you allowing in your decisions in life? What, what voices are you allowing to influence you in the decisions that you make? Where are you looking? Up to God and then out to get direction or are you just looking out to what appears good? Those who make decisions, hear me church, those who make decisions that are based on the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh cannot expect to live in the presence or in the blessing of God. You can't. You can't have both. We look up. And those who need to call on the Lord this morning to bring them into the part of your decision making and you realize this morning, man, I've been making a lot of decisions on my own. I've been looking out before I've been looking up. I'll just encourage you to be ready to respond. Verse 14 through 17. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, the Lord said to Abram, when? After Lot had parted from him. Look around from where you are to the north, south, east, and west, and all the land you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and the breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. Take note that the Lord did not speak to Abram until after he obeyed. That Abram would not receive his blessing, the fulfilled promise, until when? After obedience. It, it, it's, it's not until we see uh, um, faith put into action that we see the blessing of God in Abram's life. And it takes him quite a few years to get this lesson down. We've already seen him for the, the past few weeks make decisions based on his own thing. It's not until after obedience. I, uh, at our house, I've got three kids. Um, 
my wife and I have three kids, and we do movie nights on the weekends, okay? We, we watch one movie a week, and um, we let the kids each choose, and, and they know this, that uh, movie night is Friday night or it's Saturday night, okay? And we'll say things like, hey, uh, kids, tonight's movie night, and we always make popcorn, you know, roast it on the oven and stuff, and, and, uh, but we're not gonna do it until... You know, you get your piano done, or you get your reading done, or or you get uh, the basement picked up, or your room picked up, or different things. And and there for a while, it was like our kids just wouldn't believe that uh, we wouldn't do movie night unless they actually followed through what we had asked them and told them to do. Not even asked them to do, told them to do. You know, and and now they fully understand that if there's not obedience first, there's not going to be the blessing. After, it, it would be wrong of me as a parent. One, I'm not dangling this in front of them as like a carrot. I'm like, do this and you'll get this. No, it's just a part of our routine. But I cannot and should not reward disobedience with blessings. It, it conditions them what? To ultimately rebel against the authority of God and still expect to have their cake and eat it. We, I, I cannot, I, I will not, I, I choose not, I, I can't control their behavior. I, like they are their own people. Have you ever met Essie? She is her own person. It's like my spirit animal. I stare at her and I pray. Okay. But, but there's, there's going to be no blessing unless there's obedience. Are there unsurrendered areas in your life? I'll just allow the spirit of God right now. This is the most important time, okay? Don't start checking out on me. Are there unsurrendered areas in your life that God has clearly spoken to you to give up, to part ways with, to let go of, yet you're living in disobedience? And then you live in frustration. God, why aren't you blessing me? Where is your presence, Jesus? Why, why do I not feel close to you, God? And God is saying like, hello. I'm still back at step one. What is it in your life that the Lord has revealed to you? I, I, these are just a few things, okay? And, and these are just things that as I was praying, I wanted to, to talk about because I think they're big grips in, in, in our culture, tithing. Tithing is, is not a suggestion, it's a command. A tithe is not an offering. An offering is something that I, free, I freely give. It's above and beyond. A tithe is something that God demands. What about living in sexual sin? And, and, and doing things that you know is wrong. And the Lord has told you to confess, to bring it to light, yet you're just gonna keep it in the darkness because of your position, because you teach Sunday school, because you do this, because you do that. General holiness, just watching things, and the Lord has been speaking to your heart, hey, 2023, I wanna take you to greater things, and you just will not give up that show, and you can just justify the two minutes of immorality in that show because the other 42 minutes of the show isn't that bad. And we just begin to justify those two minutes and say, oh, it's not that bad. I'm sorry, but I wouldn't eat brownies if 0.5% of the brownies had arsenic in it. Just because the 99.5% is good ingredients, it, it just doesn't make sense. Selfishness, pride. Here's a big one. You're wanting the blessing of God. You're wanting the presence of God demonstrated in your life. And he's called you time and time and time again to forgive someone. And not just say that you forgive them, but actually go to that person and forgive them. Forgiving doesn't say that what they did was okay. Forgiving them says, I am no longer going to hold this against you. You release yourself from the shackles that you have placed on yourself by holding on to unforgiveness. The greatest act of love is this, that no man has a greater act of love than to give up his life 
for one of his friends. The greatest act of love was the cross. Jesus dying on the cross for what? Forgiveness. Can I suggest to you that this morning that if the greatest act of love was for the purpose of forgiveness, that maybe the greatest act of hate is unforgiveness? Jesus takes it pretty serious where he says, if you will not forgive your father or your brother or your sister or your neighbor, your heavenly father will not forgive you. What is it that the Lord is asking you to give up that you're holding on to? God has a blessing for you, but it often requires parting ways with something or someone. Musicians, would you come and would you all stand and close your eyes? This is an important time. I, I know that there's some people that have responsibilities. And if you're watching online, this isn't a time just to, to click off. I can look at our analytics and I know when people are signing off. I want you to have a moment of an altar where God speaks to you in your own living room, in your house, wherever you might be watching. But would you just close your eyes this morning and allow God to speak to you? In just a moment, I'm gonna be calling those who feel like the Lord is speaking to areas of your heart to come forward. So Holy Father, I pray that you would speak to us, that we would put out all distractions, that there is nothing more important than right now what you want to speak, what you want to do. We are calling on the name of the Most High God. We call on your name, Jesus, because in your name there is power, there is healing, there is forgiveness, there is light, there is hope, there is strength, there is peace in the name of Jesus. And so this morning, we simply open our hearts and our minds. What are you speaking to us? This morning with every eye closed and head bowed, I've got three calls. The first is for people in the room that you feel like the Lord has revealed something or someone that you need to part ways with. Maybe it's friends that are pulling you down or a dating relationship or a bad job, but you're caught up in the money and the benefits and you feel like the Lord is calling you to part ways with your lot in your life. And you say this morning, I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna trust that he'll provide. And, and if that's you, would you just raise your hand this morning and say, I need to part ways with something or someone. Would you just raise your hand? Yes. Is there anyone else? Yes. Second, you say, I've been walking by sight rather than by faith. And I, I fall in this cycle of just asking and um, other people what they think I should do, or asking my spouse what they think I should do, asking my pastor or myself what I think I should do. And first, I, this morning, I'm going to choose to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm gonna trust in God. I'm gonna look up before I look out. And if this morning you say, I recognize that tendency and that pattern in my life, and, and this morning I commit to looking up first, and I'm gonna walk by faith, not by sight. Would you just raise your hand and say, I'm giving you control. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Yes, Jesus, yes. Thank you, Jesus. I pray right now, God, for every hand and every heart that there would be a moment where they feel the almighty power and presence of the holy God of heaven and earth enter their heart and come alongside them. And the last, with every eye closed and head bowed, say you're placing your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. That you need the forgiveness of your sins. You've never called upon the name of the Lord. And tomorrow, if you were to die, that you're not sure that you would wake up in heaven and this morning you want to receive, not on your own works, not in your own way, but by the gift of God, salvation this morning. Would you just raise your hand and look at me this morning? I want to pray for you. Is there anyone here that would say, I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart, forgive me and save me. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your, your, your goodness to us. And I pray right now, as we sing this song, as we begin to declare your greatness, that you are in control, God. We lift our hands to heaven because you are worthy, because there is nothing that can add to your perfection. You're our way maker. You're the promise keeper. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God of Paul and Peter and John, and you are the God of my family. And so this morning, my eyes are on you. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Lift my Amen. hands to heaven.